brothers and sisters, welcome uh, to the program. I would say the last dispensation, but we've got Scott Palmer here, and we've got Jared from Christian Homestead, and it's me, Troy, and uh, we thought we would get together and and crush our skulls and <laughs> see what comes out of it. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Came from my um, shirt. It's a cow skull. Yeah, yeah. I like your you shirts. I love that shirt. Thanks. You do have some classy shirts there. Is that from your merch? No, I got this oh. at Boot Barn. Here's, here's, here's mine today. Before? Here's mine. Yes. Right on. Right on. I like that shirt. I love Texas. Yeah, it's a great. My daughter lives there. We go there quite often, and and her family and see them and I, I this I love the people and the culture and but the, it is hot this time of year wow yeah. we're going next week actually so it's hot here in yeah. California too we've got an overcast so the last few days we've had an overcast yeah so hey we. so I want to go ahead and just jump right into this let's get into this so I Jared and I had a video recently and we were talked we had discussed the the and it's a it's a pretty popular topic because I talked to you on the phone today about this brother Palmer. Um, why do I want to call you brother Palmer? You, <laughs> I know it sounds pretty cool because you, you look you you look you look wise and old like a an old. <laughs> well, and look at all the books back there. That shows how smart I am right there. The books. Yeah, and and I think you've got the real profile of the prophet Joseph up there. I do. Yeah. Um, but we were talking about the elites, not the elites, I'm sorry, the intellectuals oh, yeah. in the church. And the reason I wanted to uh, segue into that is because we were talking, I don't know, do you want to, what, what was the main, what was your main concern? Brother? Mine? No, Scott, oh. sorry. So, um, so with me, and I, I, I did watch your, your video, you two, uh, that you did together, and it was awesome. Here, here's the problem I have with, with this, this, this culture of, of the intellectuals in the church. And sometimes I think it stems from BYU but, and, and CES, but not always. But, but the problem is, is that you have to have a title behind yourself before you're you're legit before you can have any insights and and i just i i, I that, that's not the gospel to me anyone anyone who studies by the holy spirit and and can gain you know some insights to me has has legitimate input whereas i think so i not to I don't want to target people in, in this particular video. I do, I do on my own, but I, I don't. But there's a book out there, and you all know it, Rough Stone Rolling. And, and it, it specifically about Joseph Smith. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is epitomizes this, this intellectual approach of throwing everything out there that's, that was said about Joseph Smith, whether it had any mm -hmm. kind of... Uh, 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 um, factual evidence, just throw it out there and, and then let people kind of decide, you know, what kind of man Joseph Smith was. And I, I never, I, I never feel comfortable with, a, with, with that type of a book. And just one other thing I'll say, and then, you, and then I'll, let, I'll just listen to you guys, but went on a, an Israel trip. The first time we went, we did the tour. It was great. And we had a, um, a very well-known uh, scholar in the LDS church with us. And somehow, I, I don't even know how we got on the topic. And, and most of it was wonderful, but we got talking about the flood. And this particular person who's, like I say, very well established, he said, you know, the flood was regional. It didn't cover the earth. That's just, it's not possible. And I was kind of shocked because for me, the flood is more of a, a, a doctrinal uh, that the earth need, needs to be baptized by water and by fire, just like we need to be baptized by water and fire. So there, there has to be a completion. 
And well, and not only that, sorry, it was taught no, no, by it was taught by the prophet Joseph Smith too. Taught by the prophet Joseph Smith. There's there's tons of evidence of that. So, but but this this is um, taught by several professors at BYU. Now, this particular person who I'm talking about isn't is he's a CES Moore University of Utah um, professor uh, with with the institute there uh, he retired now more so than attached to BYU but that's what that's what I'm talking about is is explaining away miracles and wonderful things because actually they just make sense anyway that that's where I'm coming from yeah I actually before hopping on here I did a video that I'm going to put out tomorrow and um I was talking about this concept because Troy in the, in the last interview that we did, he brought up this thing about Orson Pratt, where there were a couple of things like theories and stuff that he had put together that the church uh, officially disavowed. And, and it was in the, the did you get that news. email from me? Yeah. 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 Okay. And so I, I did like a big thing into that. And it's like, I think it's okay to, because like everyone treats speculation, like it's the devil, which yeah. I don't think it is like, I, I think it's okay to think about things, but like where you cross the line is where you start uh, preaching those thoughts. And so like with the professor, that's like, no, no, there was no worldwide flood. Like, you don't know, like that might be what saying what science indicates right now. So what you should say, uh, if you feel really strongly about it is like, well, in the scientific world, there's not a whole lot to back that up, but I don't know, rather than just like make the assumption, no, it didn't happen mm -hmm. because like science isn't perfect, doesn't know everything. And um, so anyway, and that's one thing that uh, Orson Pratt did some of, he had a couple works that he did. Like there was one book, I guess, called The Seer and some other things. And then the church had to be like, no, don't teach this as doctrine. Like don't, don't put out like new doctrine or whatever. So, and I think that's what a lot of intellectuals you know, struggle with is like, they do know a lot. I have no doubt that they know a lot, but sometimes maybe their vision gets a little bit, a little bit cloudy. They think that they know more than they really do, or they feel like they have the, the authority to say, oh no, this or that did not happen. So yeah. I, I think you do have to be careful whenever you like, let's listen to the scholars and what they have to say. And I think there's a difference between speculating and, uh, like you, like you both are saying, um, saying this is gospel or 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 this or explaining away what the prophets have uh testified about not and i'm not just talking about the apostles like um uh orson pratt and 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 bruce r mcconkey and did we lose scott no, I think I'm oh. still here. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I still see him. You had this frozen smile. Uh, I know. It was, it was so angelic, too. <laughs> it's my wonderful internet that I have here. It's fine. <laughs> well, like it one thing, uh, for example, I, I, this one thing I've heard a number of times from scholars is that they, they tend to like downplay uh, Joseph Smith's use of seer stones, which, which is something that I believe not only did he use the Nephite interpreters, but he also had two seer stones that he used to translate the Book of Mormon. And like a lot of scholars and some people don't like shy away from that, but it's like, it's okay. In the Book of Mormon, somehow the Lord fashioned the Liahona, which was a device, a tangible machine of some kind. So it's like, it's fine. Like there's precedent for it. And it's, it's not really that big of a deal. I'm trying to remember in the Doctrine and Covenants where it talks about the, where, where's the, the vision of this, uh, where, where's he, he's Joseph Smith is explained by an angel, uh, about the seven seals. Oh, in, uh, DNC 77. Is that's it where, 77? Okay. I that's, like the, that's the question and answer section about the book of revelation. Right. Right. And it says that the first seal was the first thousand years and the second seal, the seventh, the second thousand years and so on and so forth. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah speaking about this earth's temporal existence well that's another thing a lot of the elites uh 
elites. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got that something on my mind right now. The What's intellectuals going, going on with the farmers. But anyway, um, the intellectuals will explain things. That, and I and you the reason I brought this up again is because we there's two different aspects of this right now that um, there are we've come a long way from uh, well, we used to say every member a missionary, right? And even before that, in the days of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and John Taylor and all those and, and all the early apostles, it was everyone that, that received, there, there weren't a bunch of Bible scholars back then. And, and we preached the gospel by the Holy Ghost and it was emphasized that it's the spirit that mattered and and it still is but there is somewhat of a divide now between those who get their degrees in theology and and in in church history um and, and those are great and noble things but but what really matters is is the spirit to me um, I'll bet there's probably like, I can think of like two main reasons why it probably happens. One, we kind of already touched on, it could just be simply pride. Like you think you really know all there is to know about a particular subject. So it could be pride, being blinded by your own pride, but also uh, there's social press pressures too, especially within academia, because, you know, you kind of have to fit in with the rest of them and you don't want to like stand out or, or seem like you're not being scientific you're not um a true academic so i think there's probably a couple different reasons why this happens from what well, i can tell yeah and and um i wanted to share something there was a we were talking of okay so the other divide going on in the in the in the church with intellectualism is is our what's going on morally um and that's what we were talking about. Remember, Scott, you were talking about a, a specific uh, brother that you brought up before. Um, did you want to elaborate on that a little bit, or? Well, well yeah. Without, Still you don't have to like go into detail about any names or anything. Just. My, can you hear me all right? It, yeah. It's a little bit choppy, but I can hear you. I'm sorry. It just says that my internet is unstable right now. I don't know what's going on. So if you can hear me. Um, well, one thing about the recording, here's the interesting... just real quick, the yeah. recording, we'll hear choppiness, but for some reason, you know, when you play it back, it just, a lot of times it'll play back good. Yeah, but it'll, it'll be sped up like this real fast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, so one of the, the things that's evolved is, and, and probably since Bruce R. McConkie, so I, and I'm glad you brought him up because Bruce R. McConkie was not only an intellectual, in my opinion, but he was an ecclesiastical leader. He was an apostle for many years. And so now we typically don't have ecclesiastical leader i guess we could say neil a maxwell was was in that category too but and maybe elder bednar now but but typically now it's it's you have the the intellectuals the scholars the 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 educated in in that particular field of theology that are putting out things and then you have the ecclesiastical leaders that that are usually speaking in general terms for the most part. So I love, the reason why I love Bruce R. McConkie is he was willing to put his opinion out there as an apostle and he took some grief for it. And he still, he still does, which is a shame because he always said, you know, that this is what I'm, this is, he might not have said, this is my opinion, but he, he made it clear that these were his thoughts at the time and he changed on a few things over time, which I, I think is wonderful. Now, 
back to this guy who I don't know if we'd classify him as an intellectual or not, but there's a lot of people putting out things that are contrary to the proclamation, the family proclamation to the world, um, you know, getting involved in the, in, in some of these modern uh, issues, the social justice issues. And, you know, they, they take hold, they get a grip and they have a, a pretty good influence on the, the community, particularly in Utah. And I think it does spread out. And I, I just feel that, that if there's another opinion out there, which is, might be mine, that I have every right to say, you know what, I don't feel comfortable with what is being taught here in this particular book. And, 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 and in this case, I know the guy, I've met him, I've had conversations with him. So it's not like, and he's published and, and everything else. So I think we as members have an obligation to say, I don't know if I, I agree with that, just because, you know, Deseret Book might pick them up or, or uh, uh, Bookcraft or somebody else doesn't mean that it's necessarily, you know, sound. That's just my opinion. Yeah. Thank you. Agreed. Yeah. Uh, the, we're, let me hit one more hit on one more uh, thing on this subject and then we'll move on, I believe, but I'm going to share something with you real quick. So there's a professor named Ben Spackman mm -hmm. and have you guys heard of him? I have. Okay. At BYU. Yeah. So I've watched a few of his things. He's been on saints unscripted. He's been um, on a few other Latter-day Saint uh, podcast uh, formats and YouTube channels. And every time I've seen him, he he's what I call one of the, what I, I, I'm sure he's a great guy and I don't, I haven't studied extensively everything that he said, but speaking on the flood, um, here, let me bring this up real quick here. Uh, While you're looking that up, let me just yeah. say one thing about the flood. Then this is just from the scriptures. I would imagine that it would have had to have been global in scale because otherwise, how do you get Noah in you know, probably the heartland of America, somewhere on the American continent over to the Middle East afterwards, because it, it seems like that's what happened, that the population before the flood was in the Americas. This is where the Garden of Eden was, Enoch and all that. So how is it then if there was not a global flood that he ended up, because we don't have any record of him like traveling really far uh, to get to the Middle East, right? And then- right. And then there's also, there's also, we know that at one time that all the continents were together, but then the, that they separated. And um, I don't know so much. There's so much geological evidence for that other than Pangea, but they're talking about like millions of years rather than, you know, six that or however many years. But uh, anyway, the point is we may not understand this earth as well as science would like to think that it does. Right. So I don't know. And no, and I totally, I, yes, that is, and there's no problem with that at all whatsoever. I think um, the point is also that we can get it. I think it's too easy for people to get into a habit as once they are learned and they're educated to uh be contrarians because of their whether whether it's a absolute truth or not or we don't understand it or it's a little bit different to get into the habit of 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 uh contradicting the prophets is probably dangerous ground i think that's what i'm trying to say um and not because the things that I speculate on, and I know the things that you guys speculate on, they don't completely like contradict what our modern day prophets have said or what the scriptures say. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and so, we're yeah. not preaching them as absolute truth. We're exactly. Saying, you know, it makes sense to me. 
Uh, this is my opinion. Based on my study, it seems this way. And that's totally different than being like a professor that's like, no, the flood didn't happen. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, let me. Um... It's going to be this. interesting to see whether it's in the millennium or whether it's after that. Once we understand exactly how everything works, how much we didn't know, you know, because science has its limits. Uh, History, historians, they have their limits. You can only do so much with what we have and you can put together probably a pretty good picture of things and and you can respect that. But right. they, They don't know everything, obviously. Yeah. Exactly. Here we go. So this is what Ben Spackman said in, in a, uh, an essay that he wrote on uh, the flood. Uh, it, this is just one paragraph. And, and I'll break down what I'm implying here. The people who, re, who, the people who joined the restoration in the second quarter of the 19th century were not tabula rasa. Okay, so I, tabula right, rasa. what does that mean? Blank slate. Okay. Blank slate. Okay. So why couldn't he just say blank slate? (laughs) It's a famous like philosophical phrase. When you get into um, what's called epistemology, it's the study of like, of knowledge. Like how do we obtain knowledge? Oh, right, right, right. That's where I know it from. So it's probably from that. Epistemology. I know that from, um, remember the, oh, uh, Carrie Molstein. He yeah. wrote that he would talked about that in his book. Okay, yeah. so he goes on. Most, with some exceptions, came out of a Protestant background. Therefore, it is to be expected that at least some Protestant understandings would find their way into the Restoration and remain in the church. But the Restoration was much more than simply a rearranging of Protestant tenets or a reshuffling of contemporary ideas. Uh, in many ways, Latter day Saint discourse. Uh, ranged beyond its environment such is the case with latter-day saint understandings of the doctrinal significance of the flood in genesis as i was I, so i was discussing ben spackman and and so he doesn't believe he believes in a regional flood which i'm like okay that's fine but what have our modern day prophets taught on it something contrary to that okay but here's my point, whether the pro, whether it came from a pop Protestant background or not, um, who's to say that the Protestants weren't on to something that is true? Yeah. Well, but just, just because it came from a Protestant background doesn't mean yeah. that it wasn't that Joseph Smith didn't receive revelation on it as well. Does that make sense? It does. And so in first Peter, you know, we have the scripture mastery verse for Christ once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. I can't remember exactly. Um, uh, which, yeah, which sometime were disobedient and once in the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing where in few, that is eight souls were saved by water. And we memorized that. And then The very next verse says, the like figure whereunto uh, doth all now us. It bears the flood baptizing the earth to us being baptized. And so whether it was the Protestants that that looked at that, and there's and there are other scriptures, but that one is is so uh, to me. I can connect with that and go, oh yeah, okay. So my history or my my past, my future, my present, my future is the same as the earth's. I was created spiritually. The earth was created spiritually. We learned that in the temple. Um, I came here to, to get a, a body and to be baptized physically. The earth needs to be baptized by water. And Those then, are like types and shadows, basically. Types and shadows. And yeah. then the earth we know in the future will be will be baptized by fire. We will be. We want to be. So the likeness is there, and 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 then to just go, 
while science and, and logic says there's no way that the earth could be covered with water, so therefore uh, they, we must have misinterpreted that. And that, that's, that's the issue. But anyway, it's, it, in some ways it can be minor, but doctrinally it's, it's a huge um, difference of opinion. And I find that those that I've had discussions with on this that, that I would classify as intellectuals, they, they never look at it as a doctrinal issue, which is interesting. Yeah. That's, okay. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. For, it's interesting because we learn through our scripture that apparently the earth is alive and it goes through the same ordinances. And I think it is, uh, like, a, like you said, Troy, a foreshadowing, but I think it's also I don't know. There's something special about the earth. And I think if you just simply, if you think about the last days when there's going to be a burning, a baptism of fire, that, it, you know, we know it's going to be a literal fire and it, the the scale is going to be worldwide. So if you use that logic, then you would think, okay, worldwide fire. So, and that goes along with the flood. So worldwide flood. I, I can understand their That's resistance. Beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I like under, that. I can understand their resistance because, again, well, I've actually I've seen a couple of things that show that there is um, geological evidence that there was a, a worldwide flood. I, mm -hmm. I, I, this isn't like one of my big topics, and it was a while ago, but I can understand where they come from. But I, I just hope that they don't compromise so that they fit in with their fellow exactly scientists. scientists and I think that's the whole gist here. The whole point is not so much. Sorry, did I interrupt yeah. you? No, it's not so much about, uh, you know, we're 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 elaborating on the baptism of the earth. I always find myself doing this like Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful um, uh, But like you said, Jared, you know, be careful. These are prophets. These are things you find in the doctrine and covenants. So Ben Spackman, he's been on my, my, I don't know, my intellectual person hit list. And I don't mean him to be, and I probably need to get to know a little bit more about what he teaches, but you know, things like that, you know, are we explaining away things that maybe we shouldn't be explaining away the types and shadows, the, that's too much coincidence, it, but it's not coincidence. We're baptized by water and by fire. The earth was baptized by water, by fire. We're, we're, we, the, the earth goes through three degrees of glory. We, our bodies will go from a telestial mm -hmm. to a terrestrial to a celestial body. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully I don't stop on the second one <laughs> or even the one I'm on now. Uh, well, there's this great scripture in, uh, oh, I hope I can find it. I think it's in 84, section 84, and it talks about the earth and, and because the earth, let me see if I can find it here real quick. Um, um, ba, 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 ba. Anyway, the earth abideth the celestial law because it's perfectly obedient. Um, I can't find it right off the bat, but I love it. I love that. Uh, it might be 88. Um, yeah. Uh, the earth abideth the law of the celestial kingdom for it filleth the measure of its creation and transgresseth not the law. The earth is setting the example for us in a sense. Wow. Because we know from this scripture that it is going to be celestialized mm -hmm. as for us. Yeah. You know, makes you wonder what a disobedient planet looks like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But you know, um, to, to um, it, it, the, the opposite of, of, of the professor you were talking about was the one that we talked to uh, uh, Carrie um, Molstein Molstein with the book of Abraham, because there are a lot of intellectuals that attack the book of Abraham and its origins, and he doesn't. And he, he, he's 
I bought that little booklet, the small book that he wrote on the book of Abraham. It's fantastic. It's wonderful. And, and so there are, you know, there, there are good, good intellectuals, if you want to call them that, or, or professors that, that know their business, but yet don't cave in to this, you know, trying to uh, be popular among, among the others. I, I really liked him. I thought he was a straight up guy. I, I want to give a shout out to one group of scholars. I refer to them uh, every now and then in my videos. They're called the Interpreter Foundation. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, do you know Daniel Peterson and, and those guys? Yes. They used to do like... Um, Daniel C. Peterson. Yeah. They used to do these scripture roundtables back when we were going through the different books of scripture. I, I think it was for Sunday school, if I remember right. But anyway they would do like a weekly thing and there are just so many gems there and you can tell that that group uh does not go the the cowardly way they 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 like they don't try and explain things away basically they're really yeah. good they have a youtube channel so if you guys want to subscribe check them out they're good awesome all right so uh where do we go from here I, I would like to talk a little bit about um, Israel and why um, I know Jared and I both talk about it. You've talked about Israel. And I'm going to go pop some why. popcorn while you guys. Yeah, <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> no, because you, you talk about it, too. But but the, the cool thing is, is not that many years ago, we wouldn't be talking about Israel at all. It just wasn't, it was interesting. And, you know, we had, we had scholars like Hugh Nibley and um, Truman Madsen, and I, I, I can't think of all, them, but, you know, that were bringing interesting things to the forefront from Israel. But by and large, most of us were like, eh, mm -hmm. and now I think this is the, the turning, somewhat of the turning point. I don't think the time of the Gentile is over yet, I, but I think it's winding down. I think there's, there, in any time of there, either a dispensation or a changing of, of times, there's, there's layover, there's lap over. And I think we're in that where our interest and our understanding of the importance of the, not only the children of Israel, the people of Israel, um, but our ties to it as, as members of the church. And I'm one that, and this is just my opinion, I've talked to several patriarchs. Um, as, a, as a state president, I had, to, had the opportunity to uh, actually set a patriarch apart because President, or then President Uchtdorf uh, got called to go to another country. So he called me and said, will you please set this, this patriarch apart? I was like, well, how do you do that? And he goes, well, I'm giving you permission. <laughs> You'll figure it out. So I, I, I've talked to him, but some people feel that, that we're adopted into tribes. But I think when the, the verbiage is from the loins or the blood of, you know, Joseph through Ephraim or however, you know, whatever tribe you're from, for me personally, and mine, mine says something similar to that. I think it's through the loins. I think that's a literal thing. And so our tie to Israel, which is, typically referred to in the Northern Kingdom, the 10 tribes that, that is called Israel. And we're, we're not, most of us aren't from Judah, but some, some are, but most of us aren't. But yet our tie to the land and the country of Israel is, is real and what's going on there. And I think it's fascinating because virtually every um, Latter-day Saint YouTube channel or social media somehow the the um, references of Israel and what's going on there is is talked about, and I think it's exciting because I think this is the transition point. What do you guys think? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. I have I have a few things really quick, and then maybe Troy, if you have some. So first of all, I did a video about being literally descended from Israel, and there was an Ensign article as well as some quotes from Brigham Young. And I think Joseph Fielding Smith, among a few others, that they basically all say that the majority of the church literally is of Israel and that 
there's probably very few that are like pure Gentile that join the church. So that, that's been said a few times. Um, and I think that's absolutely true. I do. And then uh, you, your channel was the first one where I kind of, the Messianic Jews came on my radar because that's something that you've mm -hmm. talked about a number of times. And so I decided to look in that, look at that closer. And it seems like that movement kind of like really started going around like the sixties or seventies and it's mm -hmm. exciting. That's what it kicked off. Yeah. And it's exciting because I think that there's a lot to that because I think a lot of people picture that the gospel going to the Jews is it's going to be us missionaries or whatever. Whereas I think it's already happening. And um, mm -hmm. I, I did one video about the three Nephites. Th this is a story from the journal of discourses where apparently in, in the early days of the church, the three Nephites appeared to some native American tribes and then they went and looked for Joseph Smith and got baptized. And so apparently one thing that they can do is influence dreams or appear in dreams. And I wouldn't be surprised at all to find out that that process has been happening among these messianic Jews, because it just like kind of came out of nowhere and at such a critical time and at a time where it does seem like the times of the Gentiles is kind of winding down and their movement keeps growing and growing and growing. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's crazy. And then one other thing I wanted to say, um, in case you guys didn't see this video I did, it's really interesting in the United States because the United States has about half of all of world Jewry. I think more than half live in mostly, you know, the New York. I area. watched that video. It, yeah. yeah. New Isn't York. Cool? Yeah. Has. Yeah. I watched that video. That was fascinating. And we, and our numbers are really similar. You said. Yes, they are. It's yeah. I like how you, the, I like how you, uh, yeah, I know what you're talking about where I was we just have, thinking about, yeah, the tabernacle, the camp of Israel. Right. It's, right. It's, I, in my mind, and I can't preach this as truth, but like I feel like I feel like it's like beyond coincidence. Our tie to them is extremely strong. And once the millennium is ushered in, it's no longer going to be us and them. It's going to be one nation the way that it was, you know, before the divide. It so just goes to, to show you that everything is in types and shadows. That's what the gospel, that's how God works, you know. The least and the, 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 just like that scripture, the, 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 the first shall be last and the last the shall last be first. Be first. Um, and, and then was it, it, yeah, Jared, it was you that we were talking about the Jews being on the East coast and then the Latter-day Saints being in Utah. Mm -hmm. And then, and then I mentioned the tribe of Manasseh being in the South. And then yeah. you said, yeah the and and then the uh the tribe of manasseh was in the southern part of israel yeah yeah uh, right? of the yeah the camp of israel uh, right. when they camped around the tabernacle and then missouri is like right in the middle of those these two population groups i actually measured it out and it's not <clears throat> it's not exact but it's pretty close like to the uh -huh. the midway point between new york and salt lake city so that's so it, it's what and there's six million Jews in the United States. It's and, something like that. It might be seven million. And yeah. six, six, and about six million Latter Day Saints in the yeah. United States. You know, just as you guys were talking, I was thinking about just how the prophet and and others have said that this that the the gospel this is an ongoing restoration. This is an ongoing restoration that the church is still being restored. That's something that hasn't been emphasized up and, and, until, I mean, like really emphasized those words until uh, President Russell M. Nelson mm -hmm. has been prophet. Mm -hmm. And it just shows, and I was thinking about, you know, the, tri the lost 10 tribes, the gathering of Israel, the scattering of Israel, what's really going on, the maturity level of the gospel what the savior is really trying to the message he was trying to get across and the infancy of the messages of like Orson Pratt 
if you read Journal of Discourses and other things that the brethren, early brethren, were uh, teaching on Israel, um, and how we, like you said at one time, were teaching that uh, that that it was completely up to us to build the temple there. I mean, it could still be that, but the mature. We're, we're, we're spiritually maturing as a people and, and as a leadership of the church and how we view things, everything is coming together, unraveling, you know, and, and, and coming out of obscurity, you know, completely, not just I love how you said that coming out of obscurity. I think that is the key. And, and you can see where the brethren are, they're associating with, with leaders of other churches they they talk about him elder anderson referred to uh, a, a minister in california talking about the church and said that that his what he said is 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 you know like christ-like behavior we never used to get that very often where where our church leaders were acknowledging other church leaders and i think this is what is opening the door up for the preparation of, of the second coming of Christ, where like-minded individuals that, that worship the, you know, the God of Israel, they might not, the Jews might not have connected with Jesus yet, but, but the, those that at least connect with the God of Israel and other Christian denominations that are like-minded, because we know that there, there's going to be other faiths during the millennium right we I, I think we're all in agreement oh yeah and it's taught it's pretty well understood and so i see our current leadership uh church leadership under president nelson starting that 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 thing because that wasn't really i didn't grow up with that it was like latter-day saint that's it we don't talk about anybody else. We don't acknowledge anybody else. And, and I don't think it, it lessens our uh, understanding that this is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the kingdom of God on earth. It doesn't lessen that. It doesn't lessen the, the ordinances and the priesthood keys restored. But what it does do is, is, is what was that phrase you used, that word? I just um, Coming out of obscurity? It. It, 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 things are coming out of obscurity where we're we're looking for ways to unite with people. Um, can I tell share one quick story? Absolutely. So Sue and I had my wife and I we had just finished our trip to Israel our first time and and we were just like Israel everything right. And can I ask you something really quick? Trip, yeah, yeah. Something really quick. This is for just everybody watching. <clears throat> when you went to Israel, were you able to get around okay? Because I know that most of them speak English. Were you able to get around okay with only speaking English? Yeah. So the first time was with the tour, and and it, it's it's easy. The second time it was just my son and I, and we traveled freely. We stayed in Airbnbs. We rented cars. Yes, the food, the water, the travel, the communication safe and we and we even went to a lot of west bank sites we went to shechem jake's well which is you know a little you know interesting uh uh canaan were the first miracle that, that we went to some of these places still felt wonderful and nice people um for the most part the palestinians were very very nice to us so communication food water all wonderful and I'm, we're going again in, um, in fact, I just finished paying my deposit today for the rest. This is kind of a, a half guided, half do it yourself trip. Um, we're, we're leaving in the end of October into November and we'll be there for our, for almost three weeks. So lucky. are you, are you going to take some video for us while you're there? I'm going to do, I'm going to do videos every day and post them up. Uh, Israel is the most um, per capita uh, social media country in the world, and you can get internet anywhere. It's awesome. So I'll have better internet 
when I'm traveling in Israel than I have in my own home. But when we got back, this is a cool story, and I'll be quick. And I know I'm doing a lot of talking, but it was Thanksgiving Day, and we were going to Heber City, Utah, to our son's home for Thanksgiving. And he, on our way there, it's about an hour drive from our house, maybe a little more. Our son called and he said, um, can you stop and get a couple of items at the grocery store? I said, I don't know if they'll be open on Thanksgiving Day, but yeah, we'll try it. So we get there. Actually, the parking lot's full. It's a Smith grocery store in Heber. So we knew it was open because it was, the parking lot was just packed with people. We get in there, we get our items, we're in line. There's people behind us. And there's this guy in front of us and he has the, the yarmulke on, right? And he's on a phone and he has some cases of water and a few items. And he's trying to finish a conversation on the phone that our checkout guy, our young man there, his name was Joshua. I'm not kidding. So he has Joshua on his name, not Josh, but Joshua. And Sue, I was kind of behind the cart. My wife goes to help this, this man with the water to, so that the Joshua could check it out and, and scan it. So we're there in line, people behind us. This guy turns to, to Sue, to my wife, and says, thank you for your help. And he said, I can see in your face you love my people. And, and Sue goes, well, you, you appear to be Jewish. And he goes, yes, I'm a rabbi. And, and then I said, yeah, we just got back from Israel a few days ago. And he said, I can see it. I can see it in your face. I can see it in your countenance. He said, can I give you a, 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 a rabbinic blessing? And we're like, heck yeah. So we join hands. Now, now mindful, we are, we haven't, he hasn't finished checking out. We haven't even started checking out. There's people behind us. We hold hands. And he blesses us. He goes through every tribe of Israel through the blessing. And then in his blessing, he states that he is from the tribe of Benjamin, which was in the southern kingdom kind of attached to, to, to Judah in a sense. They, they, they basically mingled and had the same area there. So he's a tribe of Benjamin. He gives us this awesome blessing. We're bawling, you know. And I get, I get the priesthood, I understand it, but this is this connection. And he, he said, he said, I know that you are a Latter-day Saint. That's what he said. And he goes, I know you from the tribe of Ephraim. I can see it in you. He and said that? He said that. And he said, he said, my wife is a, is a Latter-day Saint. He goes, I'm from, I'm from my, my rabbi there but I spent time in Israel and, and here. And so we had this awesome connection. So he checks out, we check out, and then he comes back to us. He waited for us to check out. And he said, I passed a grocery store on the way here. And he said, God told me that I, I needed to not go to this grocery store to go to another grocery store to meet somebody. And he goes, you two are the ones I needed to meet because I needed the, 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 the um, Afro, the the, the uh, confirmation that there are people that love my people here. Wow! It, it was one of the most incredible experiences. It, it was almost like a capstone of our trip. Well, it was it, almost like a patriarchal blessing. It was. It was. That's exactly right. That's he neat. Goes through. It was. And can I, I say something really quick? I, I have goosebumps right now. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that Jews are very, they're very evangelical as well. You know, it, they, it's they, true. They're not trying to convert you to join because that's not, but, but they want you to know how they feel. Right. Now, one, one other quick story. When my son and I went to, um, to, to Israel on our own, we, we stayed in the Jewish quarter of Jerusalem in an Airbnb and uh, I screwed up and I, I locked our key to our room in inside our room. All of our stuff's in there. It's at night. It's the Sabbath. It's a Friday night. They shut off everything. The Jews shut off everything on the Sabbath. So I'm like, how are we going to get a hold of our, our landlord 
or our uh, the, the, the because the uh, Orthodox Jew, you know, the ringlets, everything. Um, so my son said, I think I know kind of the general area where he lives. I think I, I know the apartment complex where he lives. So we go there on the Sabbath, knocking on doors, asking if anybody knows this person, right? We had his name. And mo mostly we'd get, so they're having uh, Shabbat, they're having their, their Sabbath meal celebrating. We finally knock on a door and they recognize the name of who we're trying to find. And this, this, this Jewish guy invites us into his home. He gets his two little kids, like I would say eight and 10 maybe, a boy and a girl. And he said, you take these gentlemen by the hand and you take them to this guy's house. You know where the, he lives and you take them there. So these little kids take us by the hand. We're wandering through the streets of Jerusalem. We, we, we find our, our guy. And he's, he's kind of shocked to see us. We tell him, you know, what's happened. And he says, I want to share our, uh, our dinner with you, our Sabbath dinner. And, and so we do, his wife fixes the food, we're with their family, we're with the kids. And so when you say they, they want to evan, evangelize or talk, they do. And they want to tell you about their culture. He had his Talmud, which that, that's like, um, th that's like their um, um, journal of discourses, I guess. Or, you know, it's, it's yeah, basically, yeah, basically. And it covered a whole wall of his little apartment. And he showed us he, and, and, and explained. And we talked about, I, I said, tell me about the curl, curls. Tell me about the big fur hats. He explained everything. How about the tassels that come off, like, like the garment that they wear and the tassels. He explained everything. It was the coolest experience and it totally changed because typically we think of Jews as being a little standoffish and stuff. I'm right, sure right, they're, right. They're, they're that way and they don't want anything to do with you. You're a Gentile and blah, blah, blah. I didn't find that at all. Wow. So I think that there cannot be a people that's more been more abused and misused <sighs> and killed. So if they're standoffish, it's because, I mean, just like all of us do on YouTube and the people that don't like when we say things on YouTube, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes from other churches, you know, other evangelical churches, like you can like see why the Jews are like, uh, are you, are you going to attack me or, you know, whatever, but, um, look, perfect example. That's, that's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> we, we are definitely in a time like president Nelson just said to look for and expect miracles and I have no doubt. Now that was after your stories, but as the time of the Jews starts to roll in, presumably there's probably going to be more and more of these kind of, and your, both of your stories were miracles. They were, they were absolutely they, miracles. They were exposure of them to our church, us to them with me, the whole thing with Israel 365, I did not go looking for that. They just emailed me and I was like, yeah sure let's talk so That's there's cool. probably going to be just more and more of that as time goes on and um you know i would just encourage everybody watching just look for those pray for ask for those experiences it doesn't mean that you have to like proselyte them but having friendships with them is good uh, i would encourage everybody to learn some hebrew just like download the duolingo app it's free and like you, you get to it like gets going pretty quick and so I, I would encourage everybody, maybe, just maybe, learn a little bit of Hebrew. And uh, you never know what, if you equip yourself with the necessary tools, then the Lord can make use of those tools, right? Beautiful. I love that. Yeah. So I love that. I have no doubt that when you go back this next time, you know, who knows what's going to happen this time, but I think the Lord would probably take advantage of that, that opportunity. And so, Yeah. And if anybody gets the chance to go to Israel, go to, I hope to go to Israel in my lifetime. We'll see what happens, but I'd like to go there. Me it too. took us a long time to get there. And, uh, you know, I, in hindsight, I wish I would have gone sooner, but you know, there's a time and a season for everything. And, uh, it just wasn't, it just wasn't in the cards when we were younger with, you know, in church callings and kids at home and all that kind of stuff. But, yeah. uh, I agree. It's, it's, a, and, the people I've talked to that have gone there, the, the 
Saturday Saints. I, I hear this with everybody, but I hear it that you feel like you're going home. It, like like you've been there before almost. It's it's and that that's how it was with us. So yeah. Another thing I want to say, I wanted to say, because when you were talking about how the church is talking to lots of different religions mm-hmm. and stuff, one that stands out a lot to me <clears throat> is the Muslim world. They've been mm-hmm. really talking to a lot of Muslims. They put out uh, the pamphlet. There's like, mm-hmm. there's now a section on the website, on the church's website called the interfaith relations. And there's a pamphlet mm-hmm. about Islam. And I think sometimes people may look poorly on islam because they're so different and whatever but if you think about the millennium what what you're just saying there's going to be many different religions still during the millennium and right now a quarter a quarter of the world's population is islamic but what's special about them is that they are descended from abraham and so that makes them special and so there's probably going to be a lot of work done during the millennium with the muslims so it might be that learning Arabic would be a good idea or learning more about their culture at least. But I think amazing things are going to happen for sure. I do too. Can I ask you guys both a, a question? You might not know the answer to this. I don't think we do, but what are your opinions about, do you think the, do you think the gospel has to go to Israel before the second coming or do you think that that is necessary or is that something that we're going to have to wait until um, maybe the millennium? Well, one thing is in revelation, it talks about the two witnesses and I, I hesitate to like really comment on who that is, what it looks like. Is it already happening? Because there was one person in the desert news. It was like during BYU education week that said, oh, look, we've had two prophets there ever since the BYU Jerusalem Center. They go there a lot. So in his mind, that was fulfillment of that. I don't really know, but I guess in one sense it will. And then I I also have to wonder about these Messianic Jews that are just growing in number, even though it might not be us that's doing it, something's happening. And we know that part of the gospel, a big part of the gospel is accepting Christ. So that portion of Jews have right received a portion of the gospel simply because by... there are a lot of messianic jews in israel yeah but, but they haven't necessarily been proselyted into christianity they and as the jewish jewish nationalists i guess they're they're allowed to go hey we we're accepting christ as our messiah <laughs> you know without yeah. it being proselyted in um, yeah so that's an interesting um observation there yeah. I'm trying to find this scripture. It's in first or second Nephi, and I can't find it right off. But it, but it's it's Nephi prophesying of the future of the Jews, and he said that they will come to a knowledge of Christ. It doesn't say that they're going to join a particular church. It doesn't it, that that prof that particular prophecy. So, I I think we're seeing this un, you know being unfolded and and. This interesting, like Israel 365, and like um, uh, one for Israel, which is they're, they're Messianic Jews. But then there, there's others. There's the Jewish voice, and there, there's all these, and they're connecting with with Christian denominations. Most of them they connect with their evangelicals. But it's interesting because before that, the the Jewish folks didn't want to connect with anything Christian, and now more and more are and and they're i don't know if if you guys saw this youtube video i can't remember who put it out but it was uh it was it it generated in israel and they were this guy was just asking people is it important to have a temple is it important for the jews to have a temple it was amazing the responses it was everything from now we don't need a temple anymore but mostly it was like, yes, the temple is our identity. And if that isn't something that resonates with, with us as Latter-day Saints, I don't know what is. There, there are so many Jews looking forward to the Messiah and having a temple, which is exactly what we're looking forward to. Mm-hmm. The temple of the New Jerusalem and the Messiah returning. Yeah. It's awesome. And it seems to be, from what I can tell, 
at fever pitch among the Jews. They fever are, pitch. Yeah. They are like imminently love- expecting the Messiah to come. Like in Israel 365 covers that a lot, but there's like so many different things. They're like, look, this is a sign. This is a sign. And I, I've made the case I, on my channel. I think that the Lord is working through those signs, even though they're expecting a different Messiah. They're as a people, their minds are being prepared to receive Christ when he comes. They're they're like getting in that mode right now. That's the way that I view it. No, you're I I I I know exactly what you're saying because they're gonna get exactly what they want. They're gonna get that will be our second coming Messiah. That will be the Messiah that they're waiting for. And then event and then he will show them the prince of the nails in his hands mm-hmm. and in his feet and the wound in his side. And then they'll go. Yeah. That's yeah. our Messiah. It's beautiful. You guys are awesome. I share that scripture. It's in, <laughs> it's in second. I, I found this scripture. It's in second Nephi chapter 30, verse seven. Second Nephi 30 through seven or verse seven. And it shall come to pass that the Jews which are scattered shall also begin to believe in Christ. And they shall begin to gather in upon the face of the land. And as many as shall believe in Christ shall also become a delightsome people. I think that prophecy is, uh, it's, it's begun. It's in the middle. It's towards the end. I don't know, but it's happening. It's happened. Yeah. In my opinion. Yeah. There, there's no doubt. And it, and it's stunning that you can trace it back to a certain time to like about the sixties or seventies. Mm-hmm. I mean, all throughout time, there's probably been here and there some Jewish yeah. converts, but like as like a, as a group, as a movement, sixties or seventies. So that's like really recent and, it, and yeah. it's stunning and yeah. it just keeps like going. Yeah. It's amazing. Ah, so good. So good. You guys want to end it here? I I think that it's good for me. I'm getting pretty hot in here without AC. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's 102 where I'm at. It's been it's been a hot summer. Oh, it's here too. Thank you so yeah. much for your guys' expertise in that area. Um, I need to learn a little bit more about that. Uh it's there's a lot of a lot of uh, spectacular things happening in that area. Yeah, just yeah. dive in, man. There's a lot of resources. I like to go to kabad.org because, like, they, they it's set up to like get Jews that are not observant to become observant, and so it's a, g- a great place for people that are like us trying to like learn about Judaism to like, to learn about it. So kabad you know learn some hebrew maybe watch or read uh israel 365 because they they cover stuff that nowhere else does that's right yeah uh, temple institute's another good one too i really like i listen to him once a week and uh i, I love the temple institute's really yeah all right guys okay hey stick around for a second okay all right